Ah, there's some applause. Excellent. All right. Troy Smith, who are you, and what are you doing as part of the Black Swan family? Well, that's a great question, Chris. My name is Troy Smith. I'm one of the negotiation instructors and coaches with the Black Swan Group. I've been a police officer in San Antonio for 33 years. 23 of those years, I was with, I was with SAPD. And amazingly, I spent 22 out of my 23 years in specialized units to include uh, hostage crisis negotiations. And I finished the last few assigned to the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. In 2000, I had the pleasure of meeting you at the negotiator at the two-week school, the FBI two-week school. And then, lo and behold, in 2020, of September of 2020, I got a call from your son asking if I would be interested in being part of the Black Swan Group, and I jumped at the opportunity. When and did you I and I meet? Yeah, yeah. We when met did, about when, 2000, 2001. 2000, 20, yeah. year, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Good you know, guy. it's amazing. The day after I got back, we had that international call up and you and I got a chance to talk what a day after I got back to San Antonio. That was crazy, right? And I remember we always in, in every two week school, <laughs> uh, we always said somebody, as soon as you get home, is going to be in the middle of something, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and we ended you. up having the archbishop taken hostage. <laughs> I was the first Mexican American arch archbishop in the history of the Catholic Church, right? Yeah, sure was. And he, he was taken hostage and we put in a call to your group and between the San Antonio negotiators and the FBI task force, I mean, negotiation detail, we were able to uh, have a peaceful resolution. Amen. Amen. San Antonio always had one of the sharpest teams around. You guys were always really good. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. And now, and now what are you doing? Now I'm over here at the Black Swan Group and, you know, you guys have been allowing me to teach a couple of classes. You have me teaching the negotiations nine with Sandy Hine. And then I'm teaching the caviar class, you know, the negotiation mindset, you know, teaching the high performance negotiation mindset uh, to what we call the shoe classes, you know, entry level classes for the, for the community and the future black swan family to, to learn how to negotiate business contracts and be successful. I mean, but how does that, how does any of that, how does hostage negotiation apply to any of that? That is not the same thing, is it? You know, it's so funny. Uh, in two, in the early 2000s, you and Brandon had a vision, your son. Y'all had a vision how to take the, the hostage negotiation skills that we use, you know, in the uh, law enforcement arena and, and tie it to the business community. And I thought that was one of the smartest things you could have done. We always believed that as negotiators, once we left this the law enforcement world, that we would never use these skills again, not in, in, an, in, a, in an environment where we would consider it work. You know, we got to use it on our personal lives and sometimes in our professional lives. But you guys were able to put it together in a way that now everybody can use, this, use these skills, especially in the business community. Yeah, it's kind of cool now, isn't it? Smart. That was smart. Smart, smart way of putting things together. And I love it. I'm excited about it, you know. The yeah, one you're and you're teaching the N9 now, right? Negotiation 9. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Went from, yeah, well, lay, lay, that, lay that out a little bit, would you? Yeah, the, the negotiations 9s are labels, mirrors, dynamic silence. That's what we call the quick 2 plus 1 of the 9 negotiation skills because we utilize 9 skills. That's basically the foundation for uh, any negotiation that you're going to do one of the things I love, I always remember when I first came over here was Derek saying, anytime you, you hear I need or I want, you're in a negotiation, whether you know it or not. So these skills are very exciting. You got labels, mirrors, dynamic silence, paraphrase, summary, calibrated questions, the I messages, encouragers, and the rule of three. Those are the nine skills that we use that we consider the negotiation nine. They're the foundation for dealing with any kind of situation. Yeah, that's a lot, man. It sounds really, really thorough. And it's exciting. You know, these, these skills, like I said, I never thought we'd use them again. And now we're using them in the business environment and it's turning out to be very successful. People always yeah. ask when we teach, they say, you know, why do you use these negotiations now? Why don't you just ask the question? Well, one of the problems that you have with that is 
there's a segment of the population that don't like ask, being asked questions. And when we use these skills, especially the first three, which I like, I like to consider the foundation skills to get anything started. They're the foundation, you know, the labels, the mirrors and the dynamic silence. When you label somebody, you, it, it's several ways of being able to do it. One, you have preemptive labels, you have asking labels, you know, you have the dynamic and you have presenting labels. And so it's, it's amazing that you can use those tools to get the same result without ever a- really asking a question and have the counterpart holding a whole conversation with you. All right. Now, give me an example, though, because I, I know that you've been using this stuff lately. There's there's two different stories that I know you told recently. There's a car buying, buying story that you got out there somewhere, right? The car buying story, yeah. When, when we started, uh, I started out in using the skills and the you know, when you're dealing with a salesman, they, they, they're quick to get all these yeses out of you. And I slowed them down by using the labels and mirrors. I said, it seems like you're required to sell so many vehicles a month. And he started telling me, yeah, yeah, you know, we have inventory, a lot of inventory, and, and we want to be able to get these off, moved off the lot, and you look like the kind of person that, you know, really could use a car and blase. And I said, okay. And I'm just listening to him. And I'm letting him go on. And I said, sounds like it'll affect your livelihood, the amount of cars you sell. He goes, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we have to we have to uh, get so many done a month in order to, to, to hit our hit our goal. And so I'm required to sell some sell do so many. I said, do so many. He goes, yeah, you know, when 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 we're out here, we got to hustle, man, to get these people to buy cars and everything. And I said, it sounds like you have a price in mind that, that you have to you have to get for these cars. He goes, I do, I do. You know, I said, would you be willing to share that with me? So he started throwing out some numbers. And the whole time, all I'm doing is labeling and mirroring him. One of the things I learned from that was I hadn't really said anything about myself. He was doing most of the talking. I was getting information. I was gathering what we call the black swans from it. And when he finished, he started telling me how, you know, it's getting near the end of the month and they're so close to getting their, reaching their goal that maybe I, I can, uh, he can cut me a deal, a better deal. And I let him. <laughs> I let him. In the end, he felt good about it. And all I did was mirror what he said. I labeled what he said. And I let him tell me what, what, what he thought was the value of it. And he started throwing out numbers. And then I used one of your skills that, that the Black Swan group that I really love is called the dynamic silence. I got quiet. So he didn't know if I was thinking about it or if I was ready to walk away from the deal. And ultimately, he was negotiating against himself. Yeah, right. But he didn't feel backed into a corner at any point in time, right? You didn't Not make this guy all. feel attacked. No, he. As a matter of fact, he felt like it was a, it was the perfect setting for both of us to come out of there ahead. You know, he got the he got the sale. They made some money. He gave me a better rate than most people would have gotten. He felt like you know we were, we were we had built a relationship so much so that it's so funny. I was looking for a truck several months ago, and you know how high the prices have gone up on these trucks. And he told me he says Troy, you know I've always liked you. So having built that earlier relationship, it it continued. He says, I always like it. He goes, let me tell you something. If you can hold off, wait. He goes, we bought a truck for, we sold a truck that we sold to a guy for 36000 two years ago. And we just bought it back from him. And we made $12,000 profit over what the original sale price was. We sold it for $48,000. He goes, now is not the time to buy a truck. And he sent me a text message last week saying, hey, we may have a truck coming in. Are you still interested? I told my manager how much business we've done with you and how much, you know, you mean to our to our our company. And he says, I'm going to get the price down. So I told him, let me know next week if the truck comes in and I sure would like to look at it. So working with these skills, especially, like I said, the quick two plus one, the labels and the mirrors and the dynamic silence. We were able to build, I built tactical empathy with him and I built a rapport with him to the point where now he feels like he's dealing with a friend. I'm not trying to beat him. And so he's working hard, not trying to beat me. See, here's a cool thing that I really like about that, because this is what we say all the time. You know, tactical empathy is a substitute for common ground. 
because you said earlier that you didn't say anything about yourself to him. Nothing. You know, you didn't you didn't tell him you didn't you didn't reveal uh, that you were from Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, I, that I'm a diehard New York Giants fan. <laughs> that you Jersey, you Giants fan, you're down in Texas, you're a Giants fan, you know. <laughs> and and you don't even fish for any of that stuff. Like what football team do you like? You know, who do you follow? None of that nonsense. You don't reveal because I because I know you personally. At one point in time, you back that as a bodyguard for some of the San Antonio Spurs. Is that yeah. do I recall that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, I've done it for many years. Yeah. So all this all this common ground stuff that most people tend to rely on, you're just executing a quick two plus one. This guy doesn't actually know anything about you, your sports preferences, where you went to school, how many kids you have. And he's knocking himself out trying to bring you good deals. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, we always talk about the you know, these people with this yes momentum. And that's in that industry. You get that a lot. Yes, yes, yes. You like this car? Yes. You want this car? Yes. And before you know it, they have you signing a contract and they've added all these other things into the contract. I shut him down by using a no oriented question in the deal. So would you be opposed to me sharing the price point that I can live with. And all that actually wow. happened after we built a relationship. And he says, no, nah, Troy, you know, tell me what, what can you work with? And you know how the Black Swan group does it. I started putting pen to paper, calculating the numbers. Yeah, you, well, you sit down, when you when you calculate the numbers, first that you got to write down your birth date, you got to write down <laughs> your weight. You and all the kids I have. The week, how many kids you have? You act like you, you got to act like you're doing a lot of drawing and calculating that, right? Yeah, I actually had to, I, I, but I really was counting how many mouths I had to feed. <laughs> <laughs> but that many children, you know, you have to calculate like that. You figure you'd rather clothe them than feed them. How many kids you got? My wife and I, we have eight children and thirty grandchildren. Thirty grandchildren. We just had Did number you, thirty in June the thirtieth. You guys, you guys. You you trying to take over the world down there in San Antonio? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, we, we always we've been always proud to be around a big family and we love having a big family. And that gives me a chance to, to use low stakes negotiations a lot, you know, help me hone my skills. Because these between the kids and the grandkids, they're always having a, a one or a need. So I get a chance to use those skills. They don't work too well on my wife. They they work. But she knows what I'm doing. She she tells me all the time, don't use that black swan stuff on me. <laughs> but you know, all right, That's... so let's step let's step back for just a second. Yes. Some, Shay, Shay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody for tuning in. Um and today this is our first Black Swan group uh fireside chat. So we thank you all for joining us. Um as Troy and Chris were talking about, today's conversation will be around um, the negotiation nine, everyday ways to sharpen your negotiation skills. And our featured guest today is Troy Smith. So if during our conversation you would like to ask Troy a question related to today's topic, feel free to send a message via the chat, which you can do if you see the little love emoji and it says react. You can click on an emoji and then comment your question and we'll read it on stage. And for the folks who are tuning in via desktop, be sure to request access to the Fireside app through the page you're currently on so you can join us for future conversations. And also, this is very important, be sure to follow Troy and Chris's Fireside accounts so you will receive exclusive alerts for future Fireside chats. So you can RSVP and be alerted when they go live. So without further ado, let's get started on today's topic. Um, Troy, could you tell us a little bit about the difference between a low stakes negotiation and a high stakes negotiation, just to get our audience familiar, familiar with negotiating? Shay, that's such a really good question. You know, the low stakes negotiations are when there's no money involved normally. It's an opportunity for you to practice the skills. A uh, good example of that would be if you go to Starbucks. One of our, our coaches and instructors, Derek Gaunt, always says, you know, anytime there's a I want or I need, you're in the negotiations. So if you go to Starbucks, that would be considered a low stakes negotiation, would be an opportunity 
to use some of these skills. And to give an example about going to the Starbucks and the, the barista saying, anytime someone's mean to me, I give them decaf coffee. So if you're receiving decaf coffee or you think you become immune to the to coffee, maybe it's because you were mean to the barista. So what you want to do is you want to, when you get to the barista, you want to be polite with them. You want to label. Seems like you're having a tough day if you see that he's stressed. Or it sounds like things are going pretty quickly today. You're staying busy. And that gives the barista an opportunity to take a moment to look up, look at you, see who he's talking to, and he'll give you some, inf- some feedback. He'll say something like, man, you're right. It's been a busy day. And, you know, some of these people are asking for some outrageous stuff. And you've just started a conversation with them that nobody else has done. Everybody else is just out there in a hurry to get things taken care of. They don't care about him. That gives you a chance to start building what we call tactical empathy, where you're building rapport with the barista. You do it enough times. Every time you go into the the coffee shop, they'll know you by name. They'll see you coming in. It'll brighten their day. You'll find out that you'll start seeing them smiling, even if they've had a frown all day when they come in. As soon as you walk in the door, man, hey, that's Troy. Hey, how's it going, Troy? And they start a conversation with you. The high stakes negotiation is one of those negotiations where you're going to have to be in, it's a business setting usually, and you have a boss that's telling you, you need to meet a quota or you need to get this deal done. You've been working on it for six months to a year, and you're worried about your position within the company. It's going to be a lot more stressful than talking to a barista. You're going to have to be more prepared. And hopefully at that point, you'll have a team of people working with you or more than one working with you to help you get through it. And the negotiation nine skills will be part of the tools that that you'll really want to have in order to get through the negotiation. Yes, so those were great examples. I was just looking in the chat. We have a question. Give me one second to pull it up. Okay. While you're doing that, I don't know if if they heard earlier the conversation Chris and I was having, and we were talking about opportunities that you get those low stakes negotiations in. And I was saying that I have a bunch of children and grandchildren. Almost every day I have an opportunity to do it because I always hear I want or I need. And I, I get a chance to use the low stakes negotiations. One of the things you'll find is it takes anywhere from 64 to 67 repetitions to practice, to get that skill not perfected, but better. Absolutely. And using it at a place like Starbucks, somewhere that you frequent more uh, during the day, you'll be able to get those low stakes negotiation practice skills in. And those would translate when you're ha- when you eventually have your future high priority, high stakes negotiation. Right. You'll so- find out what works best for you. You'll be more comfortable when you're doing it. Early on, we're nervous about doing it. It's like learning a new language. So you're going to be a little apprehensive about doing it under pressure. You're going to say, I don't think it'll work. But once you do it a few times in low stakes and get to start getting success with it, you'll be more willing to do it more often. Absolutely. So our question is, which of the negotiation nine skills is the best to begin with in terms of seeing results? And can you share an example of using the skill? Sure. Uh, to me, it's, it's the quick two plus one. That's the labels, the mirrors, and the dynamic silence. If you know how to label people, you, you can do what we call a presenting label or a dynamic label. Usually you, when you're first starting out, it's going to be easier for you to, to give a label that is presenting. And then you'll be able to start working more towards getting a deeper dive into it. And then mirroring is going to be important when you Bad can't question think of anything you, to label. Mm-hmm. What's a presenting label? What, good, what's good presenting? Question. How do you know what's pre- presenting? Pre- presenting label is what, what you're seeing. So if somebody's, if somebody's face is showing that they're, they're angry, they're upset, you want to label that. Seems like you're angry. It's something that they know that they know you can see. 
And when you say that, they're going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am angry. I'm pissed off right now. Right. So when you do something like that, you're, at least you're getting the conversation started. You're showing you want, you're paying attention, right? Yeah, definitely. You're definitely paying attention, and they that's what they want. The majority of people today are so quick to want to have an answer that they're not listening to what's being told to them. This gives you an opportunity to let them know that you're listening. You're starting to build a rapport with them, and they're going to want to tell you more. If you can't think of a label, you can mirror. Mirror the last one to three words that they said. And that'll help you get it, get them to hear their own words being told back to them in a way that is going to make them want to expound on what they said. Expound on what they said? Great mirror. Yes, to make you expound on what they said. They want you to be able to, you want them to be able to continue the conversation and you're listening more. We have a person that, that uh, we do some training with, coaching, and I love, what, he has an acronym. And it's called wait. Why am I talking? So when you're using the labels in the mirrors, you're getting the other the counterpart to do most of the talking. You're finding out more information about them. And what you'll find is that you're not saying much yourself. You're just labeling and mirroring what they're saying. And by the end of the conversation, they might only know two things about you, your name and the fact that you're a black swan instructor. The, the third one is the dynamic silence. Now, that's the hardest one for people to, to wrap their heads around. But it's also one of the easiest tools that we have. And the reason being is nobody likes silence. When you get quiet, people feel the need to fill that void. And we have three types of personalities that we normally deal with. We have so you know, but before we go, we before we go running down that rabbit hole, mm -hmm. let's go back. All right. So you, the question was one skill to start mm -hmm. out with, and you kind of laid out three. Mm -hmm. So if I really tied your hands behind your back and you had to just pick one, which one would it be? For a beginner, I think it would be labeling. For me, I prefer. The I, I actually prefer uh, no oriented questions. That's not really one of the skills in this in this setting. So labels would be the one that I would I would recommend for people to start with. So label again, lay, lay that baby out. Get us a couple of examples because you, you use those in that in that carbine. Yes, and and we actually give people what we call. Um, we tell them we have labels that that are go to labels. And we try to get people to use these go-to labels in any type of situation because it'll, it'll help them get better. And it's easier to use. So some of the go-to labels that we would use, because labels have structure. It seems like, it sounds like, it looks like, and it feels like. When you use those skills, you say it seems like, it sounds like, it looks like, it feels like. You're not actually saying this is what it is. You're saying this is what it seems like. So some of our go-to labels is, it sounds like this is important to you. When you're talking to the salesman and he's, he's telling you what the number is, you could say, use a, a, a label like, it looks like you've given this a lot of thought. And if they tell you something that, you know, this is the best, we could, the best price we can get, I've talked with the manager, everybody that's bought a car know that they have to go talk to the manager. Sounds like there's nothing I can do to change your mind. So that's a great way to practice the negotiation nine, specifically with labeling. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Dean Cooper, and he writes, which of the N9 skills do people struggle with the most? And what's your advice to overcoming it? Ooh, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I think... That the eye messages are one of their tougher skills. It's an aggressive skill that we have that we use, and we only use it if, if there's a persistence and somebody disrespecting you. So that's one of the aggressive skills, and we have a, we have a system for doing that when we use the the eye messages. So we would do it in three parts. 
first part is you insert the behavior. When you treat me like what I have to say is not important, I feel is the second part, and you want to target the emotion. I feel that you're not giving me a fair shake. And the because is the effect of the interaction. Because we're not able to to work together on this project. So you want to use an iMessage, and an iMessage you want to use it sparingly. Because you're going to use that as a as an aggressive tool to count to confront persistent counterproductive behavior, but you want to do it without being accusatory. Because remember, part of what you're trying to do in this process is to build that rapport and get tactical empathy. When you start becoming accusatory, it's going to pose a problem with the counterpart. Okay. And using these these skills specifically, how, how would you say tone of voice, how important is tone of voice when it comes into using all of these negotiation skills? You know, that's a really good question. Tone of voice is, is very important. It's one of the most important things you, do, you have to do when you're using these skills. I don't care if you have the skills. If you don't know how to present them in, in your tone, it's going to come off accusatory, negative. If you say something like, let's go back to the labels. It seems like you're angry. If you say it in a way that's almost in the question form, you, you, you're saying, well, it seems like you're angry versus it seems like you're angry. Which one would be a calmer, a calmer tone? Which one do you think you would get a better response from? For sure, the calmer tone. <laughs> yeah, and that's the human nature. So we use these skills and we use we use the tone by make even asking a question or basically giving them a statement of confirmation that we understand. And we could do we can do upward inflection and that's giving the question time. Seems like you're angry. Or you can give it as confirmation that you understand what they're saying. Seems like you're angry. Like I get it. I understand that you're angry about this. So when you're using these skills. Your tone of voice is going to be far more important than even using the skills. If you can say it in a way that get people to want to want to open up to you or they feel like they're not being threatened or attacked, it's going to help you out. Absolutely. And we have another question in the tra- in the chat from Amber. Let's read it. She says a drunk person was causing a row um, and the label that she used to calm them down was looks like you've had a bad day. The guy exploded raving and ranting more. Is that bad? And would there be a better N9 skill to use? Well, that's a good question. One of the things that you're going to find out is when you use a label, if it don't hit the mark or even if it hits the mark, as long as that other person has continued to give you conversation, you say, you know what is working. You're allowing that individual to vent. And if he says, if he explodes on you, you can come back with another label. Seems like I was off track. You're not saying that you, that you're not admitting that you did anything wrong. You're just saying maybe I missed the mark. And as long as they continue to give you the conversation, it's helping. And that's a skill we can all practice. If if any of us go out on Friday nights or to the bars and clubs as things open up, that will be a very great skill to practice. Well, um, we call it mislabeling. One of the things that happen when you mislabel is people's desire to correct you is so so strong that if you get it wrong, And if you say it with the right tone, they're going to correct you. They can't wait to correct you to show you how dumb you are. And while they're doing that, they're 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 going to be honest with you about what they're thinking or what's going on. 
and they're going to give you more information. You'll probably get what we call black swans out of that. Absolutely. And we have another question in the chat. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. For from Shannon Stone. Is it ridiculous to ask for tips to get better at tone in high pressure or emotional situations? Is uh, that's <laughs> Shannon? I can see you have some of the skills. Is it ridiculous? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that put a smile on my face. <laughs> to ask for tips to get better at tone. That's where you get your low stakes practice in. Deal with when you're dealing with family members, or even if you're dealing with somebody that called you know, trying to sell you something on the phone. Work on your tone with those individuals. See how it comes off. That's a low stakes practice that if it, if it doesn't work out well or they, seem, they think that you're being aggressive towards them, you'll know. And that's one of the things we do is usually get in the mirror or I like to record myself to see how I sound. I hate my voice, but I like to record myself to see if, if I can keep keep my tone, especially when somebody's upset with me. Can I stay in my seat? Can I not let my temper or my my anger start to show? So I would say record yourself or go to people that you know that you can get low stakes practice in. If, if somebody's having a bad day and they're going to explode on you, that you that's a friend or you know a family member, work on those skills. Try to keep your tone down. Be polite show difference and you'll be able to you'll be able to see the skills start to come together all right and we have a question from let's see oh matthew taylor would you like to come up on the stage and ask i'll send you a request hey guys can you hear me yeah, how you doing, Matthew? I'm doing good, Troy. This is uh, this is really exciting. I'm uh, glad to be here. So, hey, uh, question is, can you give an example of the late night DJ voice? <laughs> Have y'all been listening to Chris Chris Voss? It's funny. I I used to be a DJ actually, and you want to lower your voice, you want to slow down your cadence. You want to be more direct in the way you talk. When you're using the late night DJ voice, that's normally about 20% of your conversation. That's when you want to get, you want to use that voice, especially when you're going to ask, put out an ask, or if you're going to deliver bad news. You want the person's undivided attention. So you slow down your cadence. You get your point across. And you'll get the person's undivided attention when you're doing it. And Troy, there's a couple things there that you got to be careful about that I noticed when you executed that you were really careful about. What, what, are some, what are some of those things? Some of the things that you have to be careful about is that's a good good question, Chris? You want to uh, share them with us because you're you're the expert at that part of it. I, I between you and Derek, your voices are so twenty percent of the time that I I can't get over how y'all run the gamut with that. Well, you know, for me, it's you know I try to make sure that it's that it's soft. You know, the, there's a couple of fine lines there. You know, I know we like to say your inner voice betrays your outer voice. You don't want to sound angry. You don't want to sound condescending. Sound condescending. You know, there's just a couple of things. And when I'm when I'm doing the late night FM DJ voice, like my intention, what I want them to feel is calm. And if I'm trying to project calm into it, that's personally what works for me. That's a good point. Really good point. And that, that DJ voice actually does that for a lot of people. It, it calms them down. We were actually on a, a training with a group that had, that had been Black Swan trained. 
and they decided to start their own little training session and they asked if I would sit in on it. And that was one of the first things that happened. The, the, the people in the group were so excited about using the skills that they asked me a question about uh, labels and mirrors. And at the time, you, I didn't even realize that I was using the late night DJ voice, but I calmed down, I slowed down. And one of the people actually said, you don't realize how much calmer you made us feel just by saying things the way you said it. We've been doing these skills long enough that, and we practice them all the time, that it starts to become second nature. It's our way of thinking and our way of doing business now. So sometimes I forget that I'm actually using that skill. That's nice. awesome, guys. I, I yeah, Matt, Matthew, thanks for the question, man. That was a good question. Thanks, Matthew. And if anybody else would like to come on stage and ask a question, um, hit the love emoji and then type in your question, and you should be able to um, – it'll pull up on our end so that we can bring you up on stage. We also have a question from Alexander Gloth. Alexander, would you like to come up on stage and ask the question? Give him one second. Okay. There have been some, while waiting on Alexander, there's been some really good questions in the in the chat, sounds like. Yes. Well, let me ask, let me uh, read his question aloud. Do you ever use open-ended questions? Open-ended questions. We do it through labeling. Is how we use the, how we do the open-ended questions. We give them a question that's not just a yes or no. We, we do it by labeling the, whatever we want to say. Um, it's a little easier for us, like like we were talking about earlier. When you talk asking questions, there's a segment of the population that don't like being asked questions. So even if it's an open-ended one, they're going to be resentful. When you do it in a way that you're using the label, it seems like, it sounds like, it looks like, it feels like. You're giving them the ability to express themselves without feeling like they've been asked a question. Well, Troy, what are our calibrated questions? We get calibrated questions that are kind of similar to, to, to that style, don't we? Sure. Calibrated questions are, are that's a good, good segment. When we talk about calibrated questions, those are what we call, they're, they're really our open-ended questions. And it's designed to keep the counterpart to start thinking. They're the ones that can't be answered with a yes or no. You know, there's an exception with the no oriented question. We, we don't really want to go into that right now. People don't like to say yes. When they say yes, they feel like they're, ha they're having to commit to something. So one of the things we do is by having them say no, they feel like they're protected. In our line of work, people are always being asked yes questions. So we use no oriented questions when we do it. And some of the calibrated questions that we ask, that we use, are thought provoking questions. That way we can get the people to start opening up more without actually asking the question. So it's basically, well, you know, we, we, we got what and how questions, right? Right. We have what and how. We don't do who, when. We use we use why sparingly. We use what, why when we talk about proof of life. Other than that, we don't. We just use the what and how. How am I supposed to do that? Is probably the most famous question that that people recognize and they learn that from the book. We tell people when we're teaching this, when we're teaching the negotiation nine, even though that's a good how question, you want to use it sparingly. 
sparingly you want to set it up. You use a what question. What about this doesn't work for you? To get people to, you're asking the question with saying what, and you're allowing them to think about it and give you their side or what they're thinking. The other ones, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, what we learned in school, we get rid of everything but the what, the how, and the why when we do the proof of life. That's a great one, Troy. Um, we have Stephanie who would like to come up on stage and also ask a question. Stephanie, I'm going to bring you up on stage. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. I just wanted to generally ask everybody on stage here if I think the art of negotiating is always an incredibly critical thing to do, I think, as we're growing up and certainly get into business or politics or whatever our space. But in a time of such significant, I think, still political upheaval, the future of the economy, um, what economies are going to be thriving and what are going to be barely surviving and all the things that we're looking at in the future. How important do you all see based on your expertise and history um, in this space? How important do you think this is going to be to be for more people to engage in the art of negotiating and really learning how to hone in on these skills? I, it's feeling pretty critical to me as I'm listening. And that was my question. I that's a really good question. What we found is the people who have gone through the Black Swan Group training, they're better prepared. They've learned how to, to interact with people from all walks of life. By using these skills, you're less threatening. You start to build the relationship with people. I always say you almost become the most interesting person in the room. By using these skills, you have people willing to talk to you. They're going to tell you so many things that you didn't know. That's going to help you not just in the negotiations, but in your everyday life. You're going to learn so much about other people. And people love to talk about themselves. I don't care if they're politicians. I don't care what walk of life they are in. Most people will love to talk about themselves. And if you're a good listener, all these skills will help you every single day of your life. Thank you so much. I'll put myself back in the audience. We have another question from Amber. Amber, would you like to come up on stage? I'll send you the request. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So, uh, first off, I have to say thank you to Troy for restoring my faith in these tools. Um, I've been in free practice negotiation groups since January, since the uh, since the challenge. And the one thing that was really getting me down was constantly being mislabeled, nitpicked, and everything. And you blew me away when on that session you were talking about, I believe it's the same one. I was playing the, you were not coaching me, you were coaching the other girl who was playing the, the agent, and I was the reluctant seller. Right, and I remember well, what blew me away was how, from my comments, uh, it was a role play. It was not really me, allegedly. But you saw the real me. In coaching her, you told her the real Amber, who the real Amber is. And that was just like so uh, uplifting and moving at the same time and that was when I said okay I've got to get training from you guys directly because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been using these skills to help the people I coach in overcoming workplace bullying and they are getting their results slowly and timidly 
So first off, thank you so much for that. I have one more stupid question, which is, uh, would a why question sound accusatory even if used with a right tone of voice? If Very good question. First, thank you for everything you said. Uh, we really appreciate being able to sit in on those groups and work with, work with you guys. That just let you guys, uh, we appreciate hearing that because we genuinely want to see you get better. Uh, the question why, if you have kids, grandkids, or as you went through life, and somebody said something to you, you always ask, why? Why? My grandkids do it all the time. If I say you can't have something, why? Why? And when you get the why so many times, it's, it's always like you're questioning, or you're questioning somebody. You're making them not even want to answer. When we talk about why, we use it sparingly for the purpose of proof of life. You know? Out of all the people you could deal with today, why did you come on to this, this fireside chat with me? So we're asking it in a way to get, get you to tell us what you're thinking, what your thoughts are. You're selling us. You're selling me. You're telling me what you liked about what, what I do. You're telling me why you like it. And I'm not having to sit there and try to tell myself or tell anybody else sing my own praises. And that also will help you to find out if you're the fool or the favorite in a negotiation. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Thank you so very much and looking forward to meeting up with you in the future. Oh. Thank you, Amber. So we're coming down to the last 10 minutes of our scheduled chat. So if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or uh, do the invite to stage uh, microphone and we'll bring you up on stage. And um, Shay, if, if somebody yes. wants some more training from Troy after this, if they're intrigued, they want to hear some more because I just heard some conversation about practice groups and other ways to learn from Troy. How do they do that? Absolutely. We have a Next Level Negotiators Facebook group where you will be able to get exclusive access to our instructors. I know uh, for tomorrow, Troy will be having a live stream uh, specifically towards that group. So if you're if you want to attend and you want to practice with like-minded negotiators, um, feel free to come to my profile and I'll have the link available for you to um, access the group. We also have um, plenty of YouTube videos specific on negotiation skills and tactics that you can use to improve your daily communication or any high stakes negotiations that you are preparing for. You can always subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel and check out those videos. Um, we also have the Black Swanlings LinkedIn group, um, and there you will also be able to practice with like-minded individuals, and we also have practice sessions with our negotiator, negotiating team, that you'll be able to ask them questions and just practice any type of negotiation topic. And all of those links will be available on my profile after the end of this chat. It's pretty cool. There's even some stuff I didn't know about in there. Did you? Was one of those black swan lings? Was that what that was? Yes, black swan lings. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, we got a little. Good. We got a little. We got a little. You know, signets or whatever they call them. People want to turn into grow up to be black swans, right? Absolutely, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> All right, very good. That's my. That's my future. Future goal is to grow up to be. A full-grown black swan. <laughs> you're plenty full. You're plenty full-grown <laughs> now. <laughs> Shay, do we got another question there? We how yes. many questions we get? We have um, 
Alexander, would you like to come up on stage? I'll send you the request. Hi, everybody. How you doing, Alexander? Great to meet you all, Chris, Kayla, Troy, Shay. Thanks so much for holding this uh, session. I'm sorry I missed my last question. Um, I'm just curious on a, maybe a slightly lighter note. Um, I know we always, always think of negotiation as being part of like a serious situation, like a hostage situation or possibly business negotiations. But do you, would you agree that um, every interaction you have with another human being is actually on some level, even subliminally, uh, a negotiation? And are you always negotiating? Like we said in the Black Swan group, anytime there's a I need or I want, you're in the middle of a negotiation, whether you know it or not. You're in the middle of a negotiation. And when you use these skills, they'll become so second nature to you that the counterpart won't know that, you, that you're using them, one. Two, when you're doing that, you're getting better at, at negotiating. And it doesn't have to be a hostage situation. It doesn't have to be a business situation. It can be in your everyday life. You, every day you go somewhere, you, you, you talk to somebody, there's, a, there's an opportunity to use the skills because there is some sort of, in most instances, there's some sort of negotiation that's going to take place. Great. Thanks. Chris, do you have a point of view about that? Yeah, I like Troy's answer. I mean, um, uh, it's just, it's so all around us. Because, you know, people think negotiation is just when you're talking about money, but if you're talking about, you want to, you want to gather information, you're in a negotiation. You want to, you want to give direction, you're in a negotiation because it's about collaboration and compliance. So, uh, yeah, I think it's there all the time. Now, Alexander, what we got to do though is we got to get you out of that yes oriented question. He said, <laughs> would you agree? We got, we got to get you, we got to get you some more training so you're naturally answering no oriented questions, but, uh, your, your head's in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. Now we just get you, get you a few more skills and you'll be rocking and rolling. That sounds really cool. Thanks so much. What I I'll love is about- okay. Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'll move myself off the stage in case uh, somebody else wants to ask a question. All right. And what I liked about the beginning of what you said is one of the things, the skills that we we, we always t- remind people of, to be curious. And you started out by saying, I'm curious. We like that because we're always curious in, our, in, our, in what we do here at the Black Swan Group. That is a great question. And just to wrap up, this entire chat. Troy, what would be your most important piece of advice you give to beginners starting out on their journey to mastering the negotiation nine? I know you said be curious, but do you have anything else for us? Yes, you want to be curious. And when you start out with these skills, you want to use them the way we teach them in the beginning. You know, we, we have the crawl, walk, run mentality or shuhari, which is a Japanese term. Uh, we start out, it's just like learning a foreign language. Your mind has to adjust to it, changing the way you think and the way you talk, the way you behave. If you practice the skills in the low stakes environment, start picking up, you know, one or two every, every week, add it, add more. You'll feel better about it. You'll get better about it. You'll get more confident. And the more confident you'll get, the more you'll use the skills. Absolutely. Chris, do you have a key takeaway? Yeah, you know, one of the guys I like to quote all the time is one of our instructors, Derek Gaunt. And, you know, a mindset that I've adopted that he talks about is just get just get one degree better every day. Like, just try to get, all you got to do is get a little bit better. It's an easy goal for the day. Your day can be a victory if you just try to get a little bit better. And if you had a day that you didn't get any better, I mean, you didn't lose anything. You, you got big ambitions for the day. You got all kind of big goals. And for whatever happens, your day gets by you. Then you're mad at yourself because you feel like you missed out an opportunity. But just one degree better every day. And as Derek likes to point out, you know, one degree changes from 
32 degrees to 33 degrees, suddenly you go from water to ice. At some point in time, you're going to get a breakthrough moment. You know, from 211 degrees to 212 degrees, when you go from water into steam, that's when you take off. And so you just get yourself a little bit better each day, and then you're going to get to that breakthrough day. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us um, in our first fireside chat. Um, Troy.